Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Covenant is an accepting, welcoming community sharing the glory of God's love with all. We are a PCUSA congregation in Upper Arlington, Ohio. My name is Joel Essel. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship on our very first Sunday of Lent. Over these next six weeks, we're going to be traveling this journey to, to follow Jesus toward Jerusalem, to the upper room with his disciples, to the cross, and of course, to the resurrection. And accompanying us along the way is this devotional. Hopefully, you've already been making use of it. If not, you can catch up anytime. Uh, this last Wednesday, we, we had a special Ash Wednesday service, and I hope you're able to partake in that. Uh, if not, you can always look back on our YouTube or our Facebook page and, and watch that service, which got us kicked off on this theme of again and again. Again and again, we find our lives in places that we'd often rather not be. Can anybody get say an amen to that one? Anybody not want to be in the place that we're in right now? Yeah, and, and, and again and again, God meets us and shares that ever-present refrain that I choose you and I love you. And I will lead you to repair. There's going to be different ways that we uh, gather together, both virtually and hopefully together uh, in person as well. We're planning on having an outdoor uh, public art project that we can do together during the Lenten season. So you can look for those things. But my prayer is that, uh, that this theme, that this devotion, that these worship services bless you right where you are and that together we hold on to the hope that God will once again bring us back together and bless us with grace. Let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. For our prayer this morning, I wanted to use a poem by Reverend Sarah R. entitled, Remember When. God never begins letters with the words, I hope this finds you well, for those words imply distance. Instead, God begins God's letters to you with the words, Remember when? Beloved child, remember when we dipped our toes into the water? Remember when we dove right in? Remember when the ice cream dripped down our hands and the cicadas sang their song and the seasons changed and the days were long? Remember when we fell in love and the world was new? Remember when our heart was broken? Remember the tears? Remember the long nights? Remember when we laughed again and the sound surprised us? Remember when we marched in the streets? Remember when we cast our vote? Remember when we believed in hope? Remember when? I do. That's what God's letters say. So on this day and every day to come, remember, God is meeting you. If you look back, you might remember when. Our call to worship. From water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. From the ancestor of nations to the sun lifted up, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path. For where he is, we would be also.
our call to confession. We come to our 40-day journey of Lent with penitence in our hearts. The polarization, enmity, and fissures that have scarred our country and world are in us as well. We yearn for truth, peace, and justice. Yet we know that we have not lived as those who are formed in the truth, peace, and justice of Christ. We confess our sin, assured of God's mercy and empowering grace. Our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess our complicity in the divisions that have wounded our country and our world. We have turned aside from your way. We have failed to love you and our neighbor, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Forgive us and restore in us your spirit of compassion and justice-seeking love. Amen. And now our silent prayers of personal confession. Amen. Beloved of God, we come back again and again to hear good news spoken to us from God. The God who made you, sees you, knows you, loves you just as you are. As a called and ordained servant of Christ in the church, I declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, you are our way in the wilderness. Your word will guide us through these 40 days of Lent so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Psalm, chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. I offer my life to you, Lord. My God, I trust you. Please don't let me be put to shame. Don't let my enemies rejoice over me. For that matter, don't let anyone who hopes in you be put to shame. Instead, let those who are treacherous without excuse be put to shame. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. Lord, remember your compassion and faithful love. They are forever. But don't remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoing. Remember me only according to your faithful love for the sake of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and does the right thing. He teaches sinners which way they should go. God guides the weak to justice, teaching them his way. We live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Our gospel reading today is back to the baptism of Jesus, which we talked about not too long ago, where we hear the voice of God saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And last week with the transfiguration of the Lord up on the mountaintop, we again hear God's voice. This is my son, my beloved, listen to him. Have you heard the expression, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times? 
Well, maybe in this case, if I've told you this story once, you get to hear it a thousand times. If I've told you once, you should hear it a thousand times. You are loved. We know that God looks at Jesus and says, this is my son. I love him. I am proud of him. He brings me joy. And we know that we are children of God. And in the same way, God looks at us and says, oh, you are mine and I love you. You know, sometimes I think maybe I share this story, this message just a little too much, this you are loved. And then I think, is there such a thing as sharing too much that people of our world are loved? I don't think so. You know, our God created you just the way you are and God loves you the way you are. You are enough and you are so loved. Will you pray with me, please? Beautiful, loving God, we thank you for the reminder again and again of how much we are loved. Not for the things we do, but for who we are, the way you created us to be. Help us to live out that love so that others may see it, others may feel it, and know that the way they are right now is enough. Amen. Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Mark chapter one, verses nine through 15. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open, and the spirit like a dove coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, you are my son, whom I dearly love. In you, I find happiness. At once, the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Nazareth, announcing God's good news, saying, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lent is here once again. This 40-day journey where we follow Jesus to the cross and then to Easter Sunday. I don't know if Lent has been an important part of your spirituality or not. Some of us give up certain things, a form of fasting during Lent. Others take on certain things like a prayer practice or a certain form of service. But whatever you do or don't do, I am concerned that there is a misconception around Lenten practices. For those of us who have either given something up or taken something on, I worry that we think this will somehow bring us closer to God. But that's a mistake. And today's gospel reading makes that clear. You now, when you heard the reading this morning, you may have said to yourself, Joel, didn't you just preach on this passage like a month ago in your first sermon? Isn't it a little too early for you to be repeating yourself? Well, the answer to the first question is yes, I definitely preached on the story of Jesus' baptism just over a month ago. And the answer to the second question is probably also yes, but I can at least say that one's not my fault. You see, I don't choose the scripture readings that we read every Sunday. The lectionary does. If you don't know, the lectionary is a three-year cycle of readings that tell the great narrative of scripture without being constrained by the preacher's personal preferences. It just so happens that this preacher's personal preferences and the lectionary readings at the beginning of this year happen to overlap perfectly and repeatedly. So, you know, you might tire of this story, but I do not because 
I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And whenever the lectionary repeats itself, it always either starts or ends in a different place, and that's true here today as well. After his baptism as God's beloved, we heard a couple of verses that we skipped over last month. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. Every year on the first Sunday of Lent, the lectionary tells us the story of Jesus' temptation. Now, Matthew and Luke tell us exactly what those temptations were. Turn these stones into bread. Uh, jump off the temple. Bow down and worship me. But Mark skips over these juicy details. And in his usual Hemingway-esque brevity, Mark packs a lot into just a few words. You may have noticed that the Spirit forces Jesus into the wilderness, which is strange. The word for force is the same word that Jesus uses to drive out demons and to drive out the money changers in the temple. See, the Spirit is not inviting Jesus, not even leading Jesus. The Spirit forces him. Does that sound strange to you? It does to me. Why would the spirit of love that had just possessed Jesus in his baptism now do to him the very thing that we pray against every week? Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. In this case, the spirit does just that to Jesus. Why? Why, if God really loves Jesus, would the spirit do this? We should know that the wilderness is not simply a location on a map in ancient Israel. It is a spiritual place that we all find ourselves in again and again. We're in a wilderness right now, aren't we? And it's lasted a lot longer than 40 days. And when we're in the wilderness, we are tempted to think that God has abandoned us. That if God really loved us, this wouldn't happen. If God really loved me, why did my marriage fall apart? Why did my loved one die? Why did I get this diagnosis? Why do I feel so alone? Why is this pandemic going on for so long? Why are the evils of racism and poverty still so pervasive? Why is it that those who have the least are the ones who pay the most, while those with the most pay the least and yet still somehow act like victims? Why do these things keep happening again and again? Now, I don't have a satisfying answer to those questions, except to say that to be loved by God and to experience profound struggle, these are not mutually exclusive. Not for Jesus and not for us either. Jesus' temptation on the heels of his baptism makes it clear to us that to go through profound struggle does not indicate a lack of love on God's behalf. You can be fully loved by God and face suffering that is absolutely inexplicable. If that's true for Jesus, it's true for us as well. Jesus was in the wilderness, tempted for 40 days by Satan. Now, as with the demon-possessed people we've seen over the past few weeks, many modern Christians read about Satan and feel like this is some ancient, antiquated mythology. And truthfully, most of our understanding about Satan is not from the Bible, but from medieval tradition. The word Satan in the Bible simply means adversary. 
So think of it this way. Jesus' mission is to bring about a kinship of humanity in which we care for and include the most marginalized, in which forgiveness and compassion and self-sacrifice connect us to God and to one another. And we are now 2,000 years after Jesus, and billions of people claim to follow him. And yet, how close are we to realizing this beloved community? If this is Jesus' mission, it seems clear that it has many adversaries, including at times you and me. Do you remember that, that story in the scripture where Jesus actually refers to Peter as Satan? Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, the rock upon whom Jesus will build the church, and yet Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You see, whatever and whoever is working against God's kingdom, that is the adversary. And sometimes that's me. Yeah, I don't need to look for a man with horns and a pitchfork. Sometimes if I want to see the adversary, I just need to look in the mirror. Instead of antiquated mythology, Satan is a way to speak about the systemic and endemic opposition both in us and all around us to God's work in the world. And it is both bigger than the sum of its parts. That's how I understand Satan. And in this understanding, the adversary is all too real, and it helps explain why evil is so hard to root out. Because if I'm honest, sometimes the adversary is me. The evil of this world is not merely out there in other people. It's also in here. That, that's not shame talk or self-loathing. That's just honesty. Jesus meets the adversary in the wilderness and emerges preaching good news for everyone. How does he do it? Well, Mark tells us that the angels took care of him. Now, in the past, I've always read over this verse and not given it a second thought. I assume this meant that the angels protected Jesus from all those wild animals in the wilderness. But this time, I looked a little closer. And I don't think that's what's going on here. The word angel literally means messenger. The messengers took care of him. Well, what do messengers do? Well, messengers bring messages, obviously. So what message did they bring to Jesus that helped him so much? Well, surely they brought him God's message, the one from his baptism, that you are my son whom I dearly love, and in you I find happiness. This is the message that they tell Jesus again and again so that he knows in the midst of his trials, in the midst of his temptations, that he is truly, fully, and utterly loved by God. Jesus endures temptation and comes out the other side proclaiming good news for everyone. No matter what struggles he will face, he holds on to this message, you are my beloved child. See, it all does come back to this again and again, both for Jesus and for us. Struggles, temptations, failures, sin, the worst thing that you have ever done, no matter how many times you have done it, None of that changes the way that God feels about you. The greatest temptation of our lives is to believe that our struggles somehow mean that we are less than beloved. But in the words of Brian Stevenson, we are all more than the worst thing that we've ever done. And like Jesus, we need to be reminded again and again that we are God's 
beloved. We tell it to ourselves. We tell it to one another. And in doing so, we become each other's angels as we share this message until we finally trust that it's true. So as you begin this season of Lent, may this message sustain you in the wilderness. May you never forget that no amount of fasting or good works can ever bring you closer to God. See, that, that's a fool's errand. You may have noticed at Jesus' baptism that he saw the heavens split open. That word split in Greek is, is schizo. It's, it's a powerful word. You see, if you open something, you can close it again. But when something is split, it can never be put back together again. Beloved, you don't need to spend another moment of your life trying to get closer to God. God has already split the heavens to come and bring you a message that whatever it is you are searching for, it's already yours. We are not the ones who bring ourselves closer to God. God is the one who comes to us, meets us, and reminds us of exactly who we are again and again until we finally trust that it's true. You are beloved, beloved, beloved. Amen. There's a Presbyterian tradition, it's a Christian tradition as well, of confessing our faith together, affirming our faith in worship, and we've not been doing that for the past couple weeks. And so this week I wanted us to read together the beginning portions of the Presbyterian brief statement of faith. So you can join me as you are able. In life and death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.
call to stewardship. In Lent, we remember the gifts of nourishment that God gives us during our wilderness journey. Let us now share our gifts in joyful response to God's sustaining grace. Let us pray. O oh God, giver of all good gifts, may the gifts we offer here today bear the fruits of peace, love, and justice in our community and our world. One of the great difficulties of this past year has been our inability to mourn together. So much loss of life and livelihood. So many divisions that have been laid bare in our life together. With all the loneliness and the separation, we have not been able to collectively gather together and grieve. And Lent is a, a season of grief. And grief is, is not something to be afraid of. It is a gift that God has given us that helps us heal. Our chancel choir has prepared an extraordinary gift for us today. It's Eliza Gilkeson's Requiem. And this song was written in the wake of the horrible tsunami in Indonesia in 2004. And it speaks of a grief that is too deep for words. Only music can give voice to this kind of grief. And the song is a prayer to Mother Mary, which might be difficult for good Presbyterians to relate to. See, we've been taught to not pray to Mary. But instead of getting hung up on that, I invite you to hear this song as a prayer to the feminine motherly care of God. See, God is larger than any human category that we have, be it father or mother. 
But God's character is, in fact, disclosed through these categories. And many of us are very comfortable with the image of God as Father, but this song invites you to embrace God as a divine mother who holds you in your grief. And so I invite you to let this music sink into your soul and to begin a work of divine healing that we all so desperately need. But first, let's, let's pray together. Holy God, we pray that you would empower us with courage, with faithfulness, as we embark on this Lenten journey together. We seek for renewal and restoration during these 40 days. May we be heartened by Jesus' faithfulness in the wilderness. Be with us, Lord, in our temptation. May we hear your message of love again and again. God of the nations, we pray for peace and justice throughout your world, that all of your children may dwell securely, free of violence and injustice. Move the hearts of leaders throughout the world to hear the cries of the poor and the hungry and to ensure a rightful share of the resources that are needed to sustain life. And we continue to grapple with the challenges of this pandemic. And we pray that you would grant a special measure of strength and endurance to healthcare workers and other essential workers who labor on the front lines of the struggle. We pray for all who are now facilitating vaccinations, for those who are providing the vaccines. We pray for your comfort, for all who are sick, for all who have lost loved ones. Grant us all wisdom and courage for the living of this hour. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
As you go from this time of worship together, go knowing that whatever struggles, temptations you may face this week, any that you have faced in the past, the good news of the gospel is yours this day and every day, for you are a beloved child of God, and God finds happiness in you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.